Welcome to Anatomy and Physiology 1. This semester we're going to be covering all sorts of different topics to give you a great foundation of anatomy and physiology. And we're going to start our journey with Chapter 1, just learning the basics of the organization of the body. And then we will get into more complex processes as we progress. At the beginning of every chapter, you will notice that there are these things called learning outcomes. And learning outcomes are basically your goals for the end of the chapter. So after we go through this entire video, you should be able to understand and explain all of these learning outcomes. And this is going to be a great platform or starting point for your studying for your upcoming exams. So as we go along throughout the chapter, you'll be able to identify, answer all of these learning outcomes. As you can see, more learning outcomes here for the first chapter. We're going to go through every single one of these together as a group. And just some more learning outcomes for you. Okay, let's begin. Let's actually talk about what we're doing in this class together. You're actually, believe it or not, taking two courses at once. Anatomy is one subject or one topic, and physiology is another discipline or another study. So we're going to group them together as one class called anatomy and physiology. But let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about the differences between the two. As you can see, anatomy is the study of the structural components of the human body. Basically, what makes up the human body, what does it look like, and where are they located? That's anatomy. So notice in the picture below, you can see a brain on the left, and we're looking at the shape of the brain. You can see the different folds and wrinkles. That's anatomy. Where the brain is located, for example, in your head, that is also a topic that we will discuss in anatomy, where these things are located. If you look at the picture on the right, you'll see we're looking at brain cells. So from a microscopic perspective, there's also things we can learn in anatomy. So we're looking at actual at neurons or the cells that make up your brain tissue, which are going to be different from the cells that are in your nose, which are different than the cells in your, your biceps muscle. So anatomy is what these things look like and where are they located. Physiology is how all of those things in the body work. So how does my brain help me think? How does my brain help me move? How does my nose help me smell? So it has more to do with the function of the anatomy is what the study of physiology is. So before we dive into more details, talking about organization and homeostasis and the organ systems, the most important thing in this chapter, probably the most important thing all semester, if you don't get one thing out of, out of this semester, the most important thing I would want you to know is how structure complements function. And we call this the rule of complementarity, as you can see in that first bullet point. But what this means is structure or the anatomy or the shape of something dictates or determines the function of it. And that is a very, very, very central theme to this entire semester. So we're going to have all sorts of different cells in our body. We're going to have these weird rectangle cells in our stomach. We're going to have these weird square cells in our kidneys. Our red blood cells look like these little two-sided frisbee inner tube looking things. Our neurons, as you just saw in the previous picture, look like these little alien spider leg looking structures. And all of those shapes that I just described, because they're different, they're all going to have different functions. So the stomach is going to work a little different than the kidneys, which are going to work a little different than my brain, which is going to work different than my skin. So as we're going on through the cells and through the tissues and all the organs that you're going to learn, the shape of it is important. It's not just random. The shape determines the function of the, the organism.
In section two, we're going to be talking about the structural organization of the human body, and this is how we're going to actually group our studying for the next several chapters. We're going to start from the basic structural organization and just work our way up until we're at the more complex organ systems. And here you can see the levels of body organization. And what we're going to do is we're going to start from the very beginning, as I mentioned. So our next chapter is we're going to actually study chemistry. And no matter who you are, if you're, if you're a human being, a dog, a cat, or a lizard, it doesn't matter. All of us are made up of chemicals. You are literally just a whole bunch of water and gas molecules that are organized into all the different organs and organ systems that some of us may know about. So the body is organized. It's not random. Yes, we have a whole bunch of atoms and electrons floating around, and they may seem like to be in a random fashion. However, when you put a whole bunch of chemicals together and you organize them, we get these little things inside of all the cells called organelles. And basically, those are just our mini organs. So inside the cells of your liver, inside the cells of your kidney and in your muscles, we're going to have all these tiny organs such as the nucleus. Some of you may have heard of that. And the nucleus is kind of like the brain of the cell. But we're also going to have organs of the cell that work like our muscles, work like our liver, work like our skin. So when you put all those organelles together, you're eventually going to get real live cells. And we have all sorts of different cells in our body. We, we just saw a picture of brain cells earlier. We have red blood cells. We have white blood cells. And then we have other cells all throughout the, the body. And if you put a whole bunch of cells together, you kind of see where I'm going with this you get something called tissues. And all tissues are is just a whole bunch of cells working together for a common purpose, for a common function. And then we continue the trend. You put a whole bunch of tissues together, you eventually get our organs. You get your spleen, you get your pancreas, you get your, your bone marrow, your lymph nodes, all the things that we're going to learn about over the next two semesters. And then last but not least, if you put a whole bunch of organs together, you get organ systems, and those organ systems work together to make you, you, an organism. So an example of organs and organ systems. So my stomach is an organ. It's just one organ in my body. However, it's part of something much bigger than just the stomach, right? The stomach is connected to the esophagus, my food tube. And then from as the food goes into the stomach, it's eventually going to go into the small intestine. And the small intestine takes it elsewhere. And the, all of those structures I just mentioned are part of the organ system called the digestive system. Another example is the kidneys, or are the kidneys. The kidneys are organs, but they're part of the urinary system along with your bladder and the tubes that connect the kidneys to the bladder. And then you put a whole bunch of systems together, or actually all of the systems together. You put the urinary with the digestive, with your skin, with your respiratory, with your cardiovascular, all the systems. Then you get a nice, healthy human being, individual, or organism. So make sure that you can pick out these different levels of body organization. For example, if I say a white blood cell would fall under which of the following categories, well, in the name, it says white blood cell, right? So therefore, it would have to be some type of cell. If I say carbon dioxide, which is stuff, a very, very important gas in our body that we have to have a little bit but not too much of, we have to get rid of it after every breath pretty much, that's considered a chemical, right? It's carbon and then mixed with a couple oxygens. If I were to say my endocrine system, which is a whole bunch of different organs and glands that secrete hormones, that would be considered an organ system. So you can kind of play with different examples throughout the body. If you look on the picture on the right, you can see this pyramid and how we start really, really small with our chemicals, and then they can eventually build into cells and tissues and organs, and then the entire human body. So be able to put this together in order, 
and be able to understand or pick out examples of these. And like I mentioned earlier, this is how we're going to work in our study together. Basically, we're going to start chapter two is chemistry, then we're going to build in the cells. Chapter four will be tissues, and then we'll get into our organs. And here are the 11 organ systems that we're going to be studying together over the next two semesters. And yes, I said 11. I know that there are 12 pictures on this slide. I will explain that at the very end. But what you want to know for this introductory chapter to start off the semester is basically a main function of what these organ systems do. As we get into the individual and specific chapters, you're going to learn that your skin does a lot of cool things. Your bones aren't just stuff that holds your body weight up. They do a lot of very neat things along with your muscles and everything else. Uh, but for right now, I just want to have an elementary understanding for this beginning chapter. So let's dive in. And I know the pictures are really small. You might have to zoom in as we're looking through this. I'm just going to start at the top and just work our way left to right and kind of give you a big, big function for these organ systems. The first one is called the integumentary system, and that's a fancy way of saying your skin as an organ system, along with the hair and nails and everything else. So as I mentioned, the skin, very, very important. It does a lot of really neat things, but the number one thing that it does is protect you, right? It is our barrier from the outside world from going into the inside of our body. If I had no skin, I would more than likely be sick 24-7 because any bacteria, virus, fungus, parasite, anything out in the environment could easily enter my body and flourish inside of me, which would not be good. So number one objective is going to be protection. Go into this second organ system here. That's our skeletal system, our, our bunch of bones. And the bones have a lot of cool, neat things. Their main job is the same thing. It's protection and supporting your body weight. So think about if, if you're standing right now while watching this or just sitting, your bones are supporting you. Your bones are supporting your head. Your, your feet are supporting the entire weight distribution of your body, right? Of course, your knees and your hip and your spine help out, but so you don't fall over or have any hopefully no hip or knee pain, your bones are balancing your weight distribution. So they support you. On the next one, we have the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system is just a division of the immune system, or it's a part of the immune system. And we know that the immune system keeps us healthy, right? It keeps us from getting sick. So you can also say protection there. The respiratory system is our next one. You can see a couple of the structures such as the lungs and your windpipe and your nose. And the respiratory system in one word or one sentence, it helps you breathe, right? You need oxygen to live and you need to get rid of that carbon dioxide to live. And that's what the respiratory system specializes in. Going to the second row, you can see this uh, muscle man and the muscular system in one word or one sentence helps us move. Right? It's, it basically helps us get from point A to point B. It does a lot of other neat things, but all of your muscles, in a way, can move. We think about our leg muscles and the muscles in our neck, perhaps, but your heart is a muscle. And right, what is your heart doing every single second to, to get blood and oxygen throughout your body is it's moving. It's pumping. Uh, we also have involuntary muscle that we can't control consciously such as the muscle inside of your arteries and veins, uh, the muscle inside your hollow organs, such as your stomach and your intestines that are helping you digest and absorb your food. You don't control that, but it's still muscle and it still moves. So we'll talk more about that later on in the semester. And then the next one is the nervous system. And I'm a little biased. The nervous system is my favorite organ system to study out of all of these. But the nervous system is the capital of the human body. It's what's in charge of everything else. So if you cut your skin, your skin doesn't just automatically grow back. Your nervous system has to give it chemicals and the resources from the bloodstream. It has to tell the skin to heal. When we grow new bone tissue or when you break a bone, 
you go to the doctor's office, they put a cast around your arm, and then they charge you a lot of money. Right? The doctor didn't heal your bone, nor is the cast healing your bone. What is healing your bone, believe it or not, is your nervous system telling the bones to heal. The nervous system is very intertwined with the immune system. The nervous system is what's telling your lungs and your diaphragm to help you breathe every three, four, five seconds. And your muscles are absolutely paralyzed unless there's a nervous impulse, unless there's a, an amount of electricity from the nervous system to the muscle telling it to move. And then you could see all the other organ systems, the, the digestive system, the urinary system, you get where I'm going. All of these are controlled by your nervous system. So this is what's in charge. This is what's keeping you alive right now is the nervous system. And we'll spend a good three, four chapters just on this one organ system later on. But after we, after the nervous system, you can see the digestive system. And the digestive system is pretty self-explanatory. What's the goal? Digestion, right? Which all that means is breakdown of food things, <laughs> food products or liquid products for that matter too. Uh, we're going to break down those things into the smallest, smallest possible pieces because the blood vessels that actually absorb them are microscopically small. So when you eat your peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you chew up your food in the really small pieces, that's great, that's awesome, but your stomach and your small intestine and everything else continues to break it down until it's micro microscopic. So we can absorb it, and the whole purpose of absorbing things is we want the nutrients, right? We want the vitamins, we want the minerals, we want the energy from the sugars and from the fats, and we want the strength from the proteins. So that's your digestive system. Our urinary system is the next one. And the main function of the urinary system is to get rid of waste and filter our blood. And really, all, that's all your urine is. Your urine is just filtered blood. Uh, all, every single drop of blood in your body goes to the kidneys, and 99% of it returns back to the, the bloodstream. And the 1% ends up in your bladder eventually, and you urinate it out. So that's the job of the kidneys and the urinary system. Finally, on the bottom row, we have the endocrine system. The endocrine system is a very multifaceted system that secretes something called hormones. And hormones are chemicals that basically affect something else in the body. And when I say chemicals, really it's going to be chemicals floating around in the bloodstream because all endocrine organs and glands secrete these chemicals directly into the bloodstream. So an example is insulin. Insulin is a hormone that is released from the pancreas. It goes in the bloodstream and it tells your body to allow sugar to enter the cells to lower your blood sugar. So insulin is released and then it does something elsewhere in the body. Growth hormone is another easy one to talk about. Growth hormone is released from somewhere in your brain and it tells your body to grow and heal and repair. So it's not just your brain doing that, it's your skin, your bone, and your muscles, and your tissues. So it goes all over the body. Next is the cardiovascular system. The cardiovascular system includes the heart and all of the things attached to the heart, the arteries and the veins and all the vessels all throughout the human body. And basically this is just a big circulatory system or a big highway system, uh, tr making sure blood can get from point A to point B all over your body getting the good stuff to your tissues and getting the bad stuff eventually to your kidneys, liver, and lungs to process and possibly get rid of. And then last but not least, we have the reproductive systems. And this is why we have 12 pictures, because we know that males and females are built a little differently, right? It's still considered one organ system, though. If you're a guy, you have the male reproductive system. And if you're a female, you have obviously female reproductive organs. But they are nevertheless a system and their job if you were to describe it would be to reproduce exactly make babies right now does it do other neat things yes of course but that is what the reproductive system's main function and main goal is we'll talk more about how that works next semester so once again in summary these are the 11 organ systems make sure that you kind of have a an understanding of what all of these do and what you're going to find out as we study throughout the semester is they're all interlinked. 
they're all intertwined. They don't work by themselves. Yes, I mentioned that the nervous system controls them all, but your muscles, in order for your muscles to move, they have to be attached to your bones. So the muscles don't work separately from your skeletal system. The endocrine system that secretes all those hormones, it needs a pathway or a highway to send those chemicals, which is the cardiovascular system. And the cardiovascular system pumps the blood, but it needs oxygen in order for the muscle to work. So that's the respiratory system. And all of these work together. All 11 are constantly interlinked together. It's one big organism. So as we study, we're going to break them up into different systems. But please know, just big picture, that everything's one big unit. It's like your car, right? Yeah, you have the muffler and you have the engine and you have the transmission and the brakes. But if you take one of those away, the thing's going to break down. It's, gonna, it's not going to work really well, if at all, right? So these are the parts to your car on this slide. And all of them together, they have to work together to make your car get you from wherever you're going to or wherever you're from to wherever you're going. So let's move on and talk about what keeps these things alive or the characteristics of life. Let's move on to the next section where we talk about the six different characteristics of human life. In no particular order, there are six main characteristics of human life, and we need all six of these in order to make sure that our organism, ourselves, are healthy and alive. So first on your list is you can see organization. The body needs to be organized in, in many, many different ways. First off, we talked about our skin being our main or our first line of defense, our main protector. And that's a really great example of this organization. We need to separate what's inside our body from the outside world with all the bacteria and viruses and bugs that can affect us. However, when we dive deeper into this course and into the anatomy, we're going to learn that a lot of different body parts, organs, cells, tissues, have their own unique compartments. And yes, the heart is in between both lungs, but we need to have them separated. We need a heart cavity for the heart, and we need a lung cavity or a space for the lungs for the respective lungs. So organization is going to be very, very important to make sure that these cells are not only separated, but that they can work together and function together to keep us healthy. The second characteristic of human life is metabolism. And for a lot of us, metabolism, we may have heard of different definitions and possibly incorrect definitions of metabolism growing up. What metabolism actually is, is a combination of two processes that involve our everyday life. One process is something called anabolism or anabolic reactions. And what that means is building. So as you can see in the picture below, what we have are these little tiny pieces of food. Let's just say they're sugars, for example. And what our body likes to do is build them into much more complex structures. And that's why we eat, once again. We break down our food and we absorb it so we can build things. If we eat a lot of protein, we're going to build new muscle tissue, new tendons, new ligament tissue, new bone tissue. So anabolism is the ability to build. Now, as I mentioned with our food, though, however, before we build things, we need to break that food down to its smallest components. So those little tiny blood vessels in our body can actually absorb them. And that's what catabolism is, or a catabolic reaction. So it's taking large things such as food and breaking them down into their smallest components. And your body is doing a combination of these two processes, anabolism and catabolism, 24-7. Your bones are constantly breaking down and rebuilding. You don't have to break a bone to actually make your bones remodel or reshape. Every seven years, you have a brand new skeleton. How is that possible? Well, over the course of seven years, your body is breaking down bone tissue and then replacing it with new bone tissue. Every five to six weeks, you have a brand new skin on, on the outside of your skin. And that's why when you go and get suntanned or there's a scab or something, give it a month or two and it changes, it goes away, right? 
Every few minutes, you're making new stomach lining cells to prevent ulcers, to prevent your stomach acids from eating your organ tissue from the inside out. So that is what metabolism is. It's a combination of building and breaking. Now, yes, yeah, some of us are very, very good at building compared to breaking. So we can put on muscle very, very easily or we can gain weight very easily. Some of us are more equipped for catabolic activity where we can eat a lot of food and break it down easily or we have a hard time keeping weight on or unfortunately your body breaks things down too quickly such as osteoporosis. So not all of this is actually good. Sometimes your body is breaking down too much bone tissue too fast to where your bones actually become weak. So what a big theme that we're going to get to in just a little bit is balance and a lot of your processes in your body has this kind of building, breaking, breaking, building balance uh, to maintain a normalcy in your body. So that is the definition of metabolism. In the next chapter, we're going to dive into a little bit more detail. We're going to add a few more terms, and we're going to talk about the importance of water in this, these several reactions. Other characteristics of human life include responsiveness and movement. We need to be able to respond to our outside environment. And anything that changes, anything that causes the body to be aware of something, whether it's inside the body or outside the body, what that's called is a stimulus. So, for example, from inside of the body, if I eat something and it kind of gives me a little bellyache or I'm really, really, really full, that is a stimulus. That is something that is happening inside my belly. And it's telling my brain, hey, I'm really, really full, or my stomach is upset. But there's also stimuli that come from the outside of your body that are constantly affecting you. For example, a very loud noise sends sound waves to your ear, and it affects your everyday life. Uh, a bad smell, a good smell, a bright light in your eye. All of those are considered stimuli, or singular is a stimulus. So... In order for our body to be able to adapt and to make changes and keep everything in normalcy, we need to be able to respond to different stimuli. For example, if you shine a really, really bright light in my eye, that's kind of dangerous. That can actually destroy or hurt my vision. So there, is, there has to be some type of response to that. And your response is your brain protects your eyes, right? You either blink or squint or you put your hands over your eyes to protect you from that light, right? Another response to a stimulus would be say that you step on something very, very sharp. You're in the middle of the night and, and you're trying to get some water and you step on a, a sharp tack or a nail or, or a toy on the floor. Your response is to jerk your foot up really, really quickly. And the reason why we do that, it's a, it's a reflex, but it is a response so you don't further injure your body. Because if we just didn't withdraw, we'd step on it even further and we continue to damage tissue. So everything that happens to our body, every stimulus, is generally going to initiate some type of response in our body. And you can see the picture down at the bottom of the screen where these two people are riding uh, in it looks like a desert environment and there's several different stimuli in this area one that bright light that sun that i mentioned but two generally speaking during the day those deserts get really 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 hot so they need to be able to protect themselves one they need to be able to sweat that's a response to hot weather to cool their bodies down but two if you notice their clothing they're pretty much covered from head to toe and that's to protect them from the damaging, harmful effects of the sun rays, of the, the ultraviolet radiation. So we need to be able to respond to different stimuli to make sure our body doesn't break down. The fourth characteristic of human life is movement. And basically, uh, motion is lotion, or movement is, is healing. And a lot of times, the more you move, as long as we don't overdo it, it is good for your body. And generally when I say that, I'm talking about skeletal muscle, right? I'm talking about exercise and working out and that kind of thing. But your individual cells move. As I mentioned, your blood vessels are helping your heart, along with the pumping action, move blood cells all throughout your body. Your stomach and your intestines have to move. They have to squeeze down on that food to further break it down and move it from A to B. 
So a lot of different parts of our body have to move or have to communicate with one another in order for everything to work properly. And finally, the last two characteristics of human life, as you can see, are development and growth and reproduction. So we need to grow, we need to develop as our life goes on. And a really good example of this is take, take your fist and, and kind of ball it up like you're about to punch a, a pillow or something. And the size of that fist, generally speaking, they say that it is pretty accurate in regards to the size of your heart. And, and I would agree with that. So if you take a six-year-old or a seven-year-old and you tell them to make a fist, that should equal about the size of their heart, give or take, a, a little bit. As that six or seven-year-old grows, their fist obviously grows, but so does their heart. So does everything else in their body. Their stomach needs to grow. Their brain needs to grow. Their liver needs to grow. Their bones need to grow. Everything needs to grow in proportion in order to live a healthy and happy life. So what if that six, seven-year-old grew up to be 21 years old and their heart never got bigger from age seven? We have this really, really tiny heart and what would happen is it would be very overwhelmed. It would not be able to pump enough blood to that 21-year-old grown body. And you would probably suffer from some type of heart failure or heart attack, unfortunately. So as the body grows, everything in the body needs to grow as well. And that plays a really, really important role in repairing tissues as well. Even though as we age, as soon as you get into your 30s and 40s, a lot of things start breaking down. Your hormones slow down. Your skin doesn't heal as well. Your muscles and bones aren't as strong. But we are constantly repairing tissue even onto our, our deathbed. Uh, in your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even if you live to past 100, you do repair cells and tissues. It's just you don't do it as well compared to when you were younger. But as we grow through life, we constantly need to be growing and repairing and making new tissues in order to stay alive. And then the last little bit of the characteristic of human life is reproduction. And as you can see uh, in the picture on the left is a sperm cell uh, meeting an egg, and then eventually it can possibly form a new organism. Now, this is really, really important for characteristics of making new human lives, right? If we want to uh, populate a city or populate a nation, yes, we need to have babies. That's kind of the only way to do it. Um, but this isn't necessary for our own human life, right? You can go a life without having kids and your body won't have any serious side effects or anything like that. But if we're trying to make more human lives, reproduction, is vital, is important. You need to have a male and female make a baby. So that's what we're talking about with reproduction. We're also later on in the semester, we're gonna talk about cell reproduction. And in order to live, your cells need to constantly reproduce. That's kind of same along the same lines as this growth and development as well. Right, our stomach needs to make new cells all the time. Otherwise our stomach acids would, uh, would wreak some serious havoc inside of our bodies. And then we move on to the final section of the chapter, anatomical terms. We're going to be talking about basically anatomy, uh, a lot of different regions of the body and cavities of the body. And then we'll end with some physiology of how we maintain equilibrium or balance in the human body. Our first term for this section is anatomical position. If you take a look at the picture on the right side of the screen, you'll see this woman standing upright and notice how her palms are out to her side and they're facing forward. So you can see a side view and of course the anterior, or the, the frontal view of her. And this position, standing straight with the palms out to the side and facing forward, is what we call anatomical position. And this is gonna be very, very important because all of the terms that we're gonna learn from, for the rest of the chapter are gonna be referring to where we're at in anatomical position. Now there is one unique situation or one unique scenario where we're gonna still maintain anatomical position, but we're gonna just add a few different terms. However, we all need to be on the same page. We all need to have this universal language when we're describing locations or anatomy with the human body. So let's just pretend, hypothetical situation, let's just say that we are in the operating room. 
I am the nurse and you are the surgeon, you are the doctor. And we have this person lying on their back and we're doing an appendectomy, we're taking out the appendix. So I'm on one side of the table, you're on the other side of the table opposite of me. And I'm assisting you in the surgery and you tell me, okay, we need to move this structure left or we need to move this instrument a little bit to the left. Okay, no problem. I'm gonna move it to the left. However, my left is your right if you're standing on the opposite side of the table, right? So we're doing this delicate surgery where we don't want to create any excess scar tissue. We don't want to nick an artery or a nerve and injure the patient. And something as simple as me going left when you thought I was going to go right could really throw the entire surgical process into chaos. Same thing. If you tell me up, I don't know which way up is. Is up towards you? Is up towards the head? Is up towards the ceiling? What are you talking about? So to avoid those scenarios, we have this universal language where these terms, no matter what your orientation is, whether you're standing across from each other, whether you're hanging upside down, these terms never fail. And for the most part, what we're going to, when we reference all these terms, we're always going to be using anatomical position. So standing upright, hands to the side, palms facing forward. Before we actually dive into the, any of the directional terminology, let's just get some basics down real quick. You can see, once again, the universal standard is anatomical position. And if a patient is on the surgery table, for example, so they're lying on their back and their face is facing up towards the ceiling, we call that the supine position. So we're going to start using more technical scientific terms. Instead of saying face up, we're going to say supine. The opposite of supine is prone. For example, if you're lying down and getting a massage and your face is facing the floor, you are now in the prone position. And then at the bottom of the screen, you see these two terms, ipsilateral and contralateral. Ipsy means same. So for example, say that we're in some type of accident, unfortunately. And let, let's say I, I was in a skateboarding accident and I fell and I injured my right shoulder, scraped up my right hand, and let's say I scraped up my right lower leg as well. All of these injuries occurred on the same side of my body, so these are what we call ipsilateral injuries. And then contralateral would simply just mean opposite. So let's say I was in another skateboarding accident. I don't skateboard, by the way, but just... <laughs> Just saying, let's say I injured that same right shoulder and scraped up my left hand and maybe a little bit of my abdomen. Those are contralateral injuries in that case. Opposite sides of the body were affected or both sides of the body were affected. So you'll see these terms as we progress throughout the semester. We also need to understand body regions. Uh, as you can see in the picture on the right, there are a lot of different regions and we can be very, very specific. Eventually when we get to the skeletal system and the muscular system, we will pretty much learn all of these terms in the picture. Uh, but for right now in chapter one, we just need to hit the, the big spots, the highlights. And as you can see, uh, big, big highlights, kind of in the middle center portion of the body. What we call this is the axial portion of the body. And there, there's some big things that you need to know. For example, the word cephalic is always going to refer to the head. The word cervical is always going to refer to neck. So this includes everything in your neck. It's not just the vertebrae in your neck, but it's also the muscle in your neck. You have cervical muscles. All the structures in your throat area is in the cervical region. Your skin on the outside of your neck is part of the cervical region. Then as we move downward, or what we were going to call inferior in the body, we have the thoracic region. The thoracic region is basically anywhere where you have ribs. So this kind of whole section right here and black would be the thoracic region, also highlighted here on the right side. And then our abdominal region is anywhere where our abdomen is, our belly, pretty much, where our digestive organs are located. And then last but not least, you have your pelvis. And the pelvis is just kind of your hip, 
groin and uh, genital pubic area. So it's basically where all your hip bones, they kind of wrap around all the way around your body. We're going to call that the pelvis or the pelvic region. So most of those terms you've probably heard in the past. And as we move on to the appendicular region, we also have some terms. So the appendicular region is referring to the appendages or basically what we call the limbs of our body. So you have the two arms and the two legs. And we're going to have specific regions, as you can see on your slide. Let's go over them. The brachial region is what we refer to specifically as the arm. It's, it's really technically it's the upper arm. And this is basically from your shoulder all the way down to your elbow. So I'll put a red star right there. That's your brachial region. And what you're going to learn in this class is a lot of these terms come from either Latin or Greek origin. And the structures inside of these regions tend to be related to their names. So for example, the big muscles in your upper arm and your brachial region are called the biceps brachii and the triceps brachii. You also have smaller muscles such as the brachialis and brachial radialis in this region. You have big vessels, uh, brachial artery, brachial vein, also in this area. So we get the names from those regions. Moving down the arm, you'll see the cubital region is the elbow. Specifically, it's just the front of the elbow and maybe just a little bit of the medial side or towards your body where if you hit your funny bone really hard, you hit that cubital tunnel, that cubital region, but it's specifically the front part of your elbow. It's not the backside. We're gonna have a different name for that later on. And then as we move down past the elbow, you get to the anti-brachial region. And the anti-brachial region is what we typically refer to as your forearm. I'm highlighting that in this gold color. So it's everything between your elbow and your wrist. So we're not really going to use the term forearm anymore from this point. We're going to use this term anti-brachial. Then we have our wrist. Some of you may have heard of this term for the wrist before, the carpal region. If, we, if anybody ever has carpal tunnel, right, they have some inflammation or compression in their wrist affecting some, some fingers, maybe some numbness, tingling going on. And then if you skip ahead down towards the very last part of the slide, you'll see that the fingers and the toes, for that matter, are called the digital region or just known as digits. Moving down to the lower limbs, we have the femoral region. The femoral region is what we typically refer to in layman's terms as the thigh, but you all are future scientists and healthcare professionals. So highlighted with this green star is gonna be the femoral region. And that's the term we're gonna use from this point on. We're not gonna really say thigh anymore. And this is the region basically between that hip groin area all the way down to your knee. And same thing, it's going to have a lot of terms that are related to this region. For example, the big muscles are called the rectus femoris, the biceps femoris. You're going to have a femoral nerve in that area that helps you feel. Um, also, the largest bone in the body is in this area. It's called the femur bone. So kind of makes sense. Next term, very important, is the popliteal region. This is similar to that cubital region. Remember, the cubital region was only the front of the knee. Sorry, excuse me, front of the elbow. The popliteal region is only the back of the knee. So circled in blue on this picture on the right. The back of the knee is known as the popliteal region. And same thing, we're going to have a popliteus muscle. We're going to have some arteries and veins and nerves in that area called popliteal. Uh, but this is only the back. The front part is where your kneecap, your patella is, so we call that the patella region. Then we talk about the lower leg, and the lower leg is known as the crural region. And to be honest with you, in a hospital or clinical setting, you're probably not going to see this word crural. Uh, you're generally just going to say, say leg or lower leg. If anybody breaks the bones, the tibia, fibula bone in that region, they're just going to say you have a tib, fib break. They're not going to use the word cruel generally. But just for reference, the more you know. And then last but not least, our ankle region, instead of calling the, just like the wrist, it was carpals, the ankle is tarsal. So that's this region that I'm currently highlighting in purple. And then once again, the toes are known as the digits. 
So make sure you study these terms. Make sure you know that the cephalic region is the head, the rib area is the thoracic, your wrist is known as carpals, the back of your knee is known as the popliteal, and the best thing I would recommend is flashcards to help you remember this. Okay, so now that we know what anatomy is, now that we know what anatomical position is, and now that we know several regions of the human body, we can now move on to the directional terminology. And not to scare you or intimidate you or anything, it just takes practice, but this is generally the hardest part of this first chapter for most students, based on what I've seen in the past. And it's really just because they're new terms and you kind of have to apply your knowledge of the anatomy to use these terms correctly and accurately. So we're going to take these terms and they're grouped in pairs. So they're basically opposites of, an, of one another. You see this first pair is superior and inferior. Superior is going towards the head. Inferior is going opposite of the head towards the feet. And then same thing anterior and posterior. They're always going to be opposites. But what, what confuses students is that a lot of the times these terms can be used interchangeably or at the same time when describing different terms. So let's define these and then I'll show you some examples. We'll do some practice with it. But really at the end of the day, it just takes practice to get this down. So let's look at superior and inferior first. Superior refers to anything going towards the head. So once again, in our surgical hypoth hypothetical situation, we, we don't use the term up because based on our orientation, up could mean a lot of different things. If we say superior, no matter where we are near that surgical operating table, we, we have an idea that superior is going towards the head. So we can say that the head is very superior in the body. We can also compare different regions of the body. For example, I can say my nose is more superior than my belly button. So I'm taking two anatomical terms, my nose and my belly button, and then I'm using the directional terms to describe their relationship. My nose is closer towards the head or towards the top of the head compared to my belly button. And then the opposite of superior would be inferior. And inferior is simply just going towards the feet so same thing, we can say, for example, the knee, or let's be more specific, the back of the knee, the popliteal region, is inferior compared to my chin. And that makes sense, right? My knee is a lot closer to my feet than my chin is. So you can say the knee is inferior to the chin, or if you flip it, you can just say the chin is superior to the knee. So this is basically our fancy way of saying up towards the head or down towards the feet. Let's move on to our next pair, anterior and posterior. Anterior is always going to be referred to the front side of the body or more in front of something else. So for example, let's say my belly button once again. The belly button is anterior to the spine, right? Because the spine is in the back of the body. Another thing you can say is your chin is anterior to your ears because the chin is further in front of your ears. The ears are more towards the back of your head. Now, another term for anterior that's interchangeable is called ventral or is known as a ventral. And you're really not going to see this term until we get to the nervous system. When we start talking about the spinal cord and the nerve roots and all that, instead of using anterior, we'll generally use these ter this term ventral. But for right now, for the next three modules, we can just stick to anterior. So the opposite of anterior is posterior. And as you can see, it's just going to be towards the back. So I can say my shoulder blade, my scapula, is posterior to my sternum, my breastbone, right? My scapula is in the back of my body. My sternum is in the front of my body. I could say my gluteal region is posterior to the nose, right? The nose is in the front of my face. Gluteal region is in the back part of your your leg region, your femoral region. 
kind of where the spine meets that femoral region, if you will. And same thing as anterior and ventral. Another example of this is dorsal. Or another, excuse me, another t way of saying posterior is dorsal. So once again, with the nervous system, when we get to the spinal cord and nerve roots, we're going to use the term dorsal, dorsal, nerve root, dorsal, ganglion. It just means posterior, back. So with these terms, as I was comparing different parts of the body with the drawings, I, I really honestly, I just made that up on the top of my head, comparing the, the glutes to the chin and the nose to the ear and the shoulder blade to the sternum, the belly button to this. It's really just top of my head. You can do that too, and that's how you should study for the, your exam, is pick two random parts of the body and compare them. Now, where students get confused is where there can be more than two answers here. Now, of course, on a multiple choice test, we're only going to give you one answer. It's going to be the best answer or choose the best answer. But let's say, for example, I give you the nose compared to your spine. Well, that's a bad example. Let's do this. Nose compared to shoulder blade. How about that? So what would your answer be? The nose is superior to the shoulder blade. I would agree if you said superior. That is an awesome, perfect answer because the nose is closer to the top of the head. It's closer to the top of the body. But another answer you could have used was anterior, right? The nose is in front of the shoulder blades. Shoulder blades are in the back of the body. So both of those answers are correct. And I think that's where students kind of get intimidated or bogged down with this information is that we're using – our bodies are three-dimensional. So what we're doing is we're using these terms in, in three-dimensional terms. You, you have basically up, down, left, right, and then front and back. So yes, there are multiple answers for these types of questions. Of course, we're only going to give you one correct answer so it doesn't confuse you on your exam. Let's move on to our next – pairs of terms and continue with directional terminology. So our next pair is medial and lateral, and this is basically that, that remaining dimension. We kind of have up, down, front, and back, and this is more going to left and right in regards to our body in anatomical position. So let's do this. Let's say, let me draw a line right down the middle of the body. So I'm going to, this woman, I'm going to kind of slice her face right down the middle, go right down the sternum, the belly button, the pubic region, and kind of between her legs. That red line, anything touching that red line is in what we call the midline of the body or is the most medial part of the human body. So medial is referring to middle middle or that midline I just drew. Anything going away from that midline is what we're going to call or refer to as lateral. So same thing, we can kind of compare these terms. I can say my chin is blank to my ears. And yes, you could say anterior, right? You could also say inferior, your chin is below your ears. But in regards to these terms, medial and lateral, your chin is right in the middle of your face while your ears are out to the side. So therefore, your chin is medial to your ears. If we were comparing our elbow to our belly button or our bladder, you can see that, yes, there's, there could be a couple extra, um, excuse me, extra answers, right? If I'm comparing my elbow to my bladder, I could say the elbow is superior to my bladder. But I could also say the elbow is lateral to the bladder because the elbow is out to the sides where the bladder is kind of right in that midline. And then as we move on to number four, the fourth pair is what we refer to as proximal and distal. Now, hang with me. Proximal and distal are very unique. They're very specific. We only use these terms when we are referring to the limbs. And it has to be two parts on the same limb. So I'll put same over here. So for example, I have to compare my right shoulder to my right carpal region or my right wrist. 
if I compare my right shoulder to my left elbow, we're not going to use these terms because they're not on the same limb. Same thing if I say my right antibrachial region, which is our forearm region, compared to my right lower leg, yes, they're both on the right side of the body, but they're different limbs. One's the arm, one's the leg. So it has to be the same limb. Now, why do we do this? Well, some in some weird situations, sometimes we can get out of anatomical position, right? So say that you're in your seat uh, watching this video and you have your hands, your arms hanging down by your side and you're sitting in anatomical position. Let's just say that. If I was to tell you to compare your elbows to your wrist, you could say your elbows are superior to your wrist, right? Yeah, that, that would make sense. Your elbows are closer to the top of your head. But what if you're in class and you ask a question and you raise your hand? So hold your hand up as if you're asking a question and compare your elbow to your wrist now. And what you'll notice is your elbow is quote unquote now inferior to your wrist. It's now closer to your feet because your wrist is raised above your head. So to avoid confusion, to avoid any inconsistencies with our system, proximal and distal is going to be universal with the same limb. Now we're also going to see this next semester when we talk about the digestive system or any type of tube for that matter. For example, our arteries and our veins, we can use the proximal part of the artery and the distal part of the artery. But for the, right now, for this semester, proximal distal is only going to be referring to the same limb. So what are they? What, what's the difference? Let's draw our core of our body or outline the core of the body, the kind of that thoracic abdominal region. This is what I refer to as the trunk of the body or the core of the body. Excuse me. <clears throat> so anything touching this red box that I just highlighted, that is the most proximal part of that limb. So what connects your arm to that red box is your shoulder. So the shoulder is the beginning of your arm or what we're going to call the proximal part of your upper limb, your arm limb thing. As we move down the arm, we get further away from that attachment point. So as we go down to the elbow, we're getting distal further away from that part where we actually are connected to our chest, belly, pelvic region. As we go further down the arm, we're getting more distal. And the most distal thing in the arm are the fingers because they are furthest away from that shoulder joint. Same thing with the lower limb. Let's do the lower limb, but let's work backwards here. The most distal part of the lower limb are your toes. And as we move up to the knee region, we become a little more proximal. For more region, a little bit more proximal. And the part that's actually touching your core or connecting your lower limb to your trunk is your hip socket, your hip joint. So your hip is the most proximal part of your lower limb. So when comparing these things, remember they have to be on the same limb. So for example, let's say that I have my carpal region compared to my brachial region. So my carpal is blank to my brachial. Let's clear some of these crazy arrows out and just do one at a time. Carpal compared to brachial. My carpal is further away from that core connection, that trunk connection, that shoulder joint. So therefore, my carpal region is distal to my brachial region. Next, let's compare the femoral region to the popliteal region. Now remember, the popliteal region is more the back of the knee. Well, we can do this. There we go. The femoral region, F for femoral, and then the popliteal region here. So we could say the femoral region is more proximal than the popliteal region, or the femoral region is proximal to the popliteal. It's closer to that hip socket, that hip joint. So once again, everyone, the best way to do this is just 
study is just go over it. Repetition is king in this type of class. So make things up on the top of your head. Compare your toes to your ankle. Compare your fingers to your elbow. Compare your chin to your belly button. Compare your liver to your lungs. Just everything that we've learned so far, you can kind of just randomize and whatever comes to the top of your head, and you can use these anatomical terms. Now there is one more set that we have to get address on the next slide. So let's keep moving. The last pair in regards to anatomical terms, or it's probably the easiest one, is superficial and deep. So superficial is referring to the surface. As you can see, this is a picture of a, a pig, and basically the hair or the outside, the skin of the pig, is the most superficial thing in the body. And anything inside the body is going to be referred to as deep. So here, kind of a graphic picture, but we basically split open the throat region, the cervical region, and we're looking here. Here's your windpipe right here, and we're looking at a, the, your thyroid gland here. Here's kind of your, uh, your throat hole, basically where your mouth and your throat kind of meet in this region. So this is deep inside the body, right? We're cutting open a lot of structures. You had to remove skin. You had to remove fat. You had to remove muscle to see this picture. So superficial and deep. If I was to compare my lungs to my ribs, right? My lungs are deep to my ribs because my lungs are inside of my rib cage, right? My ribs protect my lungs. Or if I was to say my teeth compared to my tongue, or let's, let's, let's make it a little easier. Let's say lips compared to tongue. My lips are superficial to my tongue. My tongue is inside my mouth. My lips are kind of the outer portion of your mouth, right? So superficial near the surface, deep inward. Now that we've covered the directional terminology, we can move on to the body planes and sections, or as I call them, body cuts. So we are three-dimensional beings, and therefore we can arrange the body or look into the body in 3D. And a lot of times you'll see this with an X-ray, CAT scan, MRI type feature. Say that I have, or you're suspecting that I have colon cancer. Well, yeah, you can do a blood test and you can take a case history and ask me questions about my symptoms, or you can just go inside my body and take a picture of my colon, right? And how you would do that is literally just take a plane or a section of the body so you can examine the colon and not everything else. So you'd have to remove the skin, you'd have to remove my muscle, you'd have to remove, for example, the bladder that's going to be in the way of my colon, and then you can zoom in and see what we're actually trying to focus on. So there are three types, as I mentioned, three dimensions, so there are three types of planes and sections. And the first one in no particular order is called the frontal plane, also known as the coronal plane. And you can also say frontal section or coronal section. You can also say frontal cut or coronal cut. And what this cut is going to do is separate the body into a front portion and a back portion. Or as we just learned with our directional terms, an anterior and a posterior part. And we, I just use that example with the colon, but say that we have a rotator cuff thing. Say that we need to look inside the shoulder. I can set up the MRI machine to take a cut of the shoulder so I can see inside the shoulder. I can separate the shoulder from a front half and a back half and look directly into that shoulder area to see what's wrong with the patient. So this plane kind of goes up and down, if you will, to separate the front and back sides of the respective parts of the body. The next plane is a transverse plane. And a transverse plane is going to go in this direction. I'll do this in purple. And it is going to create an upper and a lower half of the body. Or as we learn, superior and inferior. So say that I need to examine somebody's brain. And we, we want to look into their cranial cavity, their brain area. Uh, what we can do is we can put the MRI or the CAT scan beam in a transverse orientation. And that way we can actually look into the person's brain. What if you tore a meniscus or an ACL in your knee? We can actually draw the beam right on the knee. And when we take the pictures, 
we will actually get a bird's eye view looking up or down into the knee to see what ligaments or what structures are damaged. So recapping the slide, the frontal coronal planes separate the body into a front and back portion or an anterior posterior portion. The transverse planes separate the body into a superior and inferior portion. So we have anterior posterior, we have superior inferior. The last thing we need to cover is going from left to right or as we learn medial lateral. So that's what we'll cover on the next slide. So the final plane or section is called a sagittal section or a sagittal plane, sagittal cut. And what that's going to do is it's going to cut the body into left and right sides. So the plane is going to go kind of straight down the body. And instead of a front and back, it's going to be a left and a right. Now there are different types of sagittal planes, as you can see in your bullet points in your notes, a mid sagittal plane would be a line going directly down the middle of the body to create equal left and right sides. So draw a line right down the middle of your face, right down the middle of your nose, your chin, and it'll go through your breastbone, through your belly button, and we're going to have completely equal left and right sides as a result. A parasagittal cut or plane or section would simply be off to the side. So say that I have a wrist injury and I need to take a look at the wrist or the carpal region. We can draw a line like this to, to take a look at the thumb side of the wrist versus the pinky side of the wrist. And because that's not directly in the middle of the body, we're going to have unequal sides. And therefore we call it parasagittal. So mid-sagittal would be very good at looking for something that's directly in the body. For example, if you want to look at your spinal cord, your spinal cord should be right in the middle of your body. So a lot of times we can take a sagittal section of that and then kind of spin it and, and turn it laterally so you can actually see the whole structure. But a parasagittal is going to be more associated with the limbs, your shoulders, your elbows, your wrists, knees, hips, ankles, those kind of things. So let's do a little review. Um, as you'll see with this slide, there are multiple answers to these questions. Now on your exam, where the, it's going to be multiple choice, we're only going to give you one actual answer choice that makes sense. The other three are not going to be correct. But this is a really, really good exercise uh, for review purposes to show you that, yes, yeah, something can be anterior to something, but it can also be superior. So what you want to do, you, you should probably pause the video and try to answer these on your own. I'd strongly encourage you to do that and, and answer all the possible choices. So the forehead to the nose uh, and go through all of them. Uh, let's say, is the forehead superior to the nose or is it inferior? Okay, write down your answer. Is the forehead anterior or posterior to the nose? Okay, write down your answer. Is it medial lateral or does that not make sense? So you should have multiple answers here. But once again, on your exam, only one is going to make sense. So take some time, pause the video, answer these seven questions, and then when you're ready, you can hit resume, and we will go over these answers. Okay, so let's go over these answers. Number one says the forehead is blank to the nose. Now the most obvious one that I think of is the forehead being kind of the top portion of your face, superior portion of your face, and the nose kind of being more so in the middle. So probably the best answer here is superior. But there are other possible choices. For example, my forehead is kind of flat and I got a really, really big nose. My nose kind of sticks out pretty far. So. I could possibly say that my forehead is posterior to my nose because my nose is really anterior. It sticks out. So you can see that's an example of how there could be multiple answer choices. Now when we go to medial and lateral, that really doesn't work, unfortunately. So yes, the nose is directly in the middle of your face. Absolutely. I like what you're thinking if you put medial lateral. However, so is your forehead. Your forehead encompasses a very large portion of your face, 
and there is a portion of your forehead that is directly in line with your nose. So that doesn't that makes the nose not exactly medial to the forehead. Um, and because the forehead is also in line with the nose in the middle part of your face, it's not exactly lateral either. So we don't really want to be using those kind of terms. So superior is the best answer, posterior also a good answer. And that should be it. Let's move on to the next one. We'll talk about an organ here. The heart is blank to the sternum, and the sternum is also known as the breastbone, but you'll have to know it as the sternum. So, what'd you come up with? A very, very good answer is, well, your sternum protects your heart, right? You can actually feel your sternum, and your sternum and ribs are in front of your heart, and therefore your heart is posterior to the sternum. Awesome, that makes sense. Another thing you can say is the heart is deep to the sternum, right? The heart is inside of our body, or at least deeper inside of our body, where the sternum you can easily feel. Uh, skin, and then not a lot of muscle that in that area, it, it's just pretty much bone. Feel the middle of your chest, you can feel bone very, very easily. So the heart is deeper inside of the body, protected by the sternum. Now, a lot of you probably put lateral, and I love what you're thinking. That's great, because the heart is a little shifted. It's not directly in the middle, middle, middle portion of the chest cavity. Um, but once again, similar to the forehead and nose dilemma is, well, the heart is in the middle of the chest cavity, and part of the right side of the heart is on the right side of the sternum. It's just the majority of the heart is a little tilted off to the left side. Uh, so medial lateral, not exactly the best choice. If we're talking about a specific part of the heart, such as the left ventricle, yeah, then you can absolutely use the word lateral. But the heart in itself is in line with the sternum. It's directly behind it. So posterior and deep are really the best answer choices there. Let's move along. The mouth compared to the ear. The mouth compared to the ear. So first thing that pops in my head is my mouth is in front of my ears. My ears are kind of near the uh, back portion of my head, if you will, and my mouth is in the front of my face. So anterior would be a good answer. Another good answer would be your mouth is a little inferior to your ears. Right, Your jaw connects to that area where your ears are and your mouth is below that articulating or that joint of the jaw. And then another one is the mouth is straight smack dab in the middle of your face and the ears are off to the side. So you could also say the mouth is medial. Running out of room here. Medial. There we go. The mouth is medial to your two ears. So all three of those answers would be absolutely correct. Once again, only one of those is going to be on a test question. <coughs> Moving right along, number four, the arms are blank to the chest. And without being nitpicky here, there's really only one answer choice that you should have gotten or should, should have arrived at, and that is lateral. Remember, standing in anatomical position, the arms are hanging down by their side, the palms are facing anteriorly or forward, so the arms are lateral to the chest. Now, why can't we use proximal distal here? Remember our criteria for proximal distal. We only use that with the limbs, and it has to be two structures on the same limb. The chest is not part of the arm. Does it connect to your shoulder and therefore connect to your arm? Yeah, but it's not part of the arm itself. The chest is actually part of that thoracic cavity, part of your torso or your trunk. So we cannot use proximal distal in this situation. The only one that actually makes sense here would be lateral. Uh, inferior superior really wouldn't work because if you stand up and put your arms to the side, your brachial region, your arm, is pretty much should be in line with your chest for the most part. So moving on to number five, the knee is blank to the thigh. Now we didn't exactly clarify which knee to which thigh like we did on number seven. So let's, uh, let's not be too crazy and too tricky. Let's just say the left knee to the left thigh. 
So in that situation, I would really only like you to have one answer, and that one answer would be distal. So since it's on the same limb, remember we don't really I, I don't really want you using superior inferior for those same limbs. I want you using proximal distal. And all we're saying here is the knee is closer to the toes than the thigh is, than your femoral region. Moving on to number six, the skin is blank to the skeleton. There should only be one answer here. You can't really use superior, inferior, anterior, posterior because your skin and your bones are everywhere, right? You have ear bones and toe bones and you have skin on your ears and skin on your toes. So the only one that should make sense here is the skin is superficial to the skeleton. Your skin is outside of your skeleton. Skeleton is deep. And then for the last one, the right knee compared to the right ankle, we basically just kind of flip number five. So the right knee is closer to the hip area or further away from the toes compared to the ankle. So the right knee is therefore proximal to the right ankle. So hopefully you did okay. If not, no big deal. This is chapter one. It's day one of class. Don't be stressing out or anything like that. Um, but what you should do is delete these and come back to these seven questions again and then compare your answers and keep on working through these to make sure you understand the rationale. Also, just make these make these things up off the top of your head. Um, let's say my shoulder compared to my belly button, my bladder compared to my elbow, my nose compared to my ears, my right knee compared to my left wrist. And, and you can just and I just spit those off at the top of my head and that's how you practice so you don't have to Google or look at like certain practice questions you can just play with your own um, anatomy and help you get ready for the exam as you see here this slide is a review for the plain sections and cuts that we just recently covered and I would encourage you to do the same thing. Hit the pause button and work through these questions by yourself. And then when you're ready, hit the play or resume button and see if your answers line up to mine. So let's look at number one first. What plane divides the heart into equal and, sorry, equal left and right sides? Very difficult question, trick question, uh, if there is such thing as a trick question. The main thing that I want you to have down on this is sagittal. If you have something sagittal or just sagittal, awesome, you're correct, you're in great shape. That's what I need you to know. Uh, we haven't really covered the anatomy of the heart and the anatomy of the thoracic cavity to really arrive at the exact question. Um, but if you look at your definitions, if we want to be really, really, really picky here, excuse me, what plane divides the heart? into equal left and right sides. So our word mid-sagittal or our term mid-sagittal, that meant dividing the body into left and right equal sides. And as we discussed a little earlier, the heart isn't exactly in the middle of the body. It is pretty much in the middle of the chest cavity for the most part, but the left side is a little bigger than the right. And therefore it is a little off kiltered, if you will, if we're drawing a straight line throughout the body. So actually, the best answer here, believe it or not, is parasagittal, regardless of what your slides and textbook says. So I'll just put para s for parasagittal. Once again, though, I, I just if you put something sagittal, I'm good with that. Your your other instructors are going to be good with that. You're okay. You got the concept. The left and right is the big thing we need you to know. Sagittal separates left and right. So then number two, what plane separates the left arm from the rest of the body? This one's a little easier. Uh, if we're in anatomical position, we draw our little stick figure guy. Really big arms, I guess. There we go. Uh, if we're separating the left arm, and he's not in anatomical position there, is he? But regardless if he was, what we need to do is we need to separate it like this. So what I just drew was a sagittal line creating a left and a right difference. And because it's not smack dab in the middle of the body, that would also be considered a parasagittal plane.
or a parasagittal section or cut. Once again, big key thing is sagittal. I need you to know that sagittal separating left to right. Let's look at number three. What plane separates the lungs from the small intestine? So we haven't exactly covered internal anatomy yet, but for the most part, we know the answer to this, right? We know our lungs are in our chest, and we know our guts and intestines are kind of in our belly region. So by that logic, you can figure out the answer. Um, the lungs are obviously going to be superior to the small intestines, and therefore we need to draw a line that separates them. So in green, if the lungs are up here in the chest cavity, and then in purple, the intestines are down here, what we need to do is we need to draw a line separating the two. And that line, what we called that was a transverse plane or a transverse section. And that creates a superior and an inferior split or a superior and inferior section. So your lungs are superior to your intestines. And then last but not least, number four, what plane divides the kidneys into anterior and posterior halves? And the, your key words here to help you answer the question are anterior and posterior halves. So whether it's the kidneys or the adrenal gland or the thyroid or, or your brain, it doesn't matter what organ we're talking about. Your answer to separate something into an anterior and posterior half is your frontal plane. And remember, we also call that the coronal section as well. So I'll just put CO for coronal. Those two words mean the exact same thing. So big thing is understanding what's separating what. Sagittal separating left and right. Transverse is separating superior and inferior. And then frontal coronal is separating anterior and posterior halves. Same thing, I would encourage you to delete this and kind of rework through this all, or just make up practice questions on your own. Take the brain and separate it from your esophagus. Take your elbow and separate it from your chest, your belly button area. Uh, you can just top your head, make up practice test questions for yourself. Our next topic is on body cavities. And what cavities are, are basically little bubbles or sections or compartments throughout the human body that contains our various amount of different organs. So as you can see in this picture, really great illustration of a body cavity, you can see the human heart and you can see this kind of balloon looking structure around the heart. And that, yes, that is actually how our heart is situated in our body. It has these protective coatings or protective linings surrounding it. So if you've ever seen in Grey's Anatomy or any of the, the medical shows where they, they stick a needle uh, near somebody's sternum or right under their sternum, and then they suck out this fluid, sometimes it's, it's yellowy and kind of pussy, sometimes it's, it's red if it's blood. Um, a lot of times what that is is some type of infection or blood pooling in this bubble area around the heart which can put pressure on the heart, which can cause the heart to fail and respiratory issues and could be a fatal crisis potentially. So we, not just, we don't just have this around the heart. We also have this around your brain. We have this around your lungs. We have this around your guts and all sorts of other various organs in your body. And the reason why we have this is if you remember, recall back to that one slide or our properties of life, our basic necessities of life, the first thing we talked about was compartmentalization, or basically just maintaining the difference between the internal environment and the external environment. Right, so I use the analogy of our skin. You know, we, we don't want bugs and stuff getting into our skin so we can get sick, but we also don't want our heart rubbing against our lungs or our stomach coming up into our chest cavity or our intestines rubbing against the back of the uterus or the bladder. We want these things separated by these cavities or these linings. So the linings are what we call membranes. And this word membrane is going to be a very popular word as the semester goes on. And all it is is a line of cells that separate two different things. 
and we have two different types of membranes in each body cavity. So you can see the first one that we're going to introduce is called the parietal membrane, and this is the more superficial of the two, or the outermost of the two. And this is what's actually lining the cavity itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show it to you in red here. And I'm going to highlight the outside of this bubble or the outside of this cavity. So that is the parietal layer of the what we call the pericardial cavity or the heart cavity. And similar here, you see this person with a a clenched fist kind of pressing into a balloon same principle you're gonna have two different membranes you're gonna have this membrane that the fist is not actually touching it's the outer part of the balloon and then you're gonna have another membrane that's actually touching the fist and I'm highlighting that in green currently if you're able to see that so the layer that's actually touching the fist or if we go back to the heart the layer that's actually touching the heart is called the visceral layer. And the visceral layer, anytime you see the word viscera or visceral, it's always going to be referring to organs. So this is what's actually touching the organ itself. So therefore, this is the deeper of the two membranes. And pretty much every single body cavity we're going to talk about from now until the very end of Anatomy and Physiology 2 is going to be these two names. Uh, whatever's touching the organ is going to be the visceral layer, and whatever's outside of the visceral layer or lining the entire cavity is called the parietal layer. So make sure you study these two terms. We're going to see this a lot, uh, especially next semester. So now that we know the anatomy of a cavity with the visceral and parietal layers, now we can actually learn the names of all of the different cavities throughout the body. So two major, major cavities. Uh, we're going to start with these two over-encompassing or big ones, and then we can zoom in on the two and have these kind of subcategories or sub-cavities. But the two big ones that you need to know... Uh, number one is the dorsal cavity, also known as the posterior cavity, right? Dorsal, posterior mean the same thing. And then the second one that you're going to see that's not on this slide is the ventral cavity. So I'll put it down here, or also known as the anterior cavity. So every single category cavity in the body every cavity in the body is going to fit under one of these two categories it's either going to be part of the dorsal cavity or the ventral cavity because these are the only these are the two major cavities as you can see on your slide now it's very easy to separate these in your mind or distinguish them when you're studying because as you notice the only two parts of the dorsal cavity is anything to do with the nervous system So our first cavity is the cranial cavity. That's where cranial, referring to the brain area here in red. And then your brain, with the help of your brain stem, attaches to your spinal cord. And your spinal cord runs all the way down the majority of your back. And that's it. Those are the only two parts of the dorsal cavity. It's anything to do with your nervous system, or I really should be more specific. It's your central nervous system. So we'll put C-E-N, central nervous system, because you do have nerves all over your body. So because the spinal cord is in the back and the spinal cord attaches directly to the brain, those two structures, those two cavities are considered part of the back side of the body, dorsal cavity. And anything else we talk about, anything with the lungs, the heart, the intestines, the bladder, uterus, anything else, and um, e even the ab other abdominal organs such as the liver and the pancreas, they're all going to be falling under this category, the ventral category. So if you know that the brain and spinal cord is in the back, you can assume that everything else is in the front, and your assumption would be correct.
as you see on this slide, the second major category, as I mentioned, is the ventral cavity, aka anterior cavity. And that's where everything that's not central nervous system is going to be found. So everything that's not brain and spinal cord is going to fall into this category. And many different subcategories that we can dive into in regards to the ventral cavity. You can see one of them is the thoracic cavity. And the thoracic cavity is referring to anything regarding the chest area. Basically, assume anywhere where you have ribs is a good way of, of remembering that. So this circle in black encompasses the thoracic cavity. And as you can see, inside of the thoracic cavity, inside of that black circle I just drew, we have other cavities or more specific cavities. So this word right here, mediastinal, trips up a few folks so let's spend some time on that I'll try to do that let's do that in dark blue the mediastinum is just this very center center portion of your thoracic cavity the center portion of your chest so basically it's that orange looking cavity on top of the heart and the heart is that light blue cavity so it's everything except the lungs. You can see the purple lungs out to the side. The lungs are not part of the mediastinum. They're not in the middle, middle of the thoracic cavity. So that's what the mediastinum is. It's just the middle or medial part of the thoracic cavity. Now, inside of that, we have two cavities, as I just mentioned. This orange structure here is simply called the superior mediastinum. I'll put superior MS, superior medial stinal cavity. And that's an area where we have different types of organs. Mainly, it's going to be something called the thymus that's going to be involved with our immune system later on. Uh, you also have a few tubes in that area, such as your wind tube or your air tube, your trachea, your windpipe and your food tube going down to your stomach, your esophagus. So it's just smack dab in the middle of your chest area. And then below that, we kind of just covered that on the previous slide. Your heart cavity is called the pericardial cavity. So when you see this prefix peri, that usually means around or upon or surrounding. And that's what we're saying here is cardia, cardio means heart, right? If you're working out cardio workout, you're working out your heart and peri is just around it. So it's the bubble or the sac around your heart. So that would be the pericardial cavity, this light blue structure there. And then last but not least, you have the pleural cavities out to the sides. You have a left pleural cavity for your left lung. You have a right pleural cavity for your right lung. And then as we move on down, we get, we'll get to the next slide, but we have our abdominal cavity in that pink color, and then we'll have our pelvic cavity in green. As you can see on this slide, the first bullet point, just highlighting once again the mediastinum. The mediastinum is basically the middle, middle part of your chest. So that includes the pericardial cavity, the heart, and then includes that superior mediastinum where you'll see the thymus and your trachea esophagus that I mentioned. And then the pleural cavities, the lungs out to the sides. Inferior to that is something called the abdominal pelvic cavity. And that's just kind of this combination of the abdominal area and your pelvic area. And we're going to see this in more detail on the next slide. Um, we're, we're actually going to go into further subdivisions or subcategories with this cavity. But one thing I really do want to point out before we move on to that is the separation between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity has a very important landmark, or in this case, a muscle. So if you draw a black line between the two, as you can see on the pictures, that black line separates the thoracic cavity 
and that, that mediastinum and the abdominal pelvic cavity. And what that muscle is called is the diaphragm. And the diaphragm, we'll get to more in detail next semester, but the diaphragm is our major breathing muscle. And it's also a very good separation between our abdominal cavity and our thoracic cavity. So your stomach and your intestines hopefully aren't coming up and touching your heart and lungs. Um, one, we have cavities to protect us, but the diaphragm serves as a pretty good border or barrier to that as well. And yes, it is spelled a little funky. It's got that silent G in there. Diaphragm is how you say it. So let's move on to the next slide and we'll talk about the abdominal pelvic cavity specifically. We'll dive into a few more uh, sections of this area. So depending on what field you're going to be going into, uh, you do have to know the regions or quadrants of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Uh, if you're going into nursing and probably rad tech and physical therapy, you probably really honestly just need to know the quadrants, uh, which will be this. All you have to do is you just draw kind of a crosshair right at the belly button region. And what you get is you get this uh, kind of four square type looking picture and you can separate the organs and the compartments of the abdominal pelvic category into these four squares. But to be a little bit more specific, in case you're going into research, in case you're going into surge tech, or in case you're taking the first examination, because this will all be on there, uh, we're also going to talk about the specific regions. And what you do here is you draw a little tic-tac-toe board throughout the abdominal pelvic cavity. And what that does is it gives us nine specific regions that we can isolate or talk about different organs and their locations. So first let's talk about the quadrants uh, because the quadrants are just simpler, they're just easier. So remember in anatomical position, if you're looking at somebody, it's their left and right is flip-flopped, right? If I'm talking to you and you and I are having a face-to-face -face conversation, the left side of my body is directly across from the right side of your body. So what you're looking at here in this person is here's the left side, here's the right. And same thing on this, this would be left, this would be right. So this area with the star right here would be the left upper quadrant. And all that means is it's the left upper square, if you will, of the abdominal pelvic cavity. And you can find certain organs in this area, such as the stomach, such as the spleen and the pancreas. Those are kind of the big ones that reside in that area. If you go to the right here, you can get the right upper quadrant. And the two major organs there are gonna be your liver, that big red thing that you see, that's kind of taking up the whole quadrant, if you will. That's the liver. And then there's a little green thing on the backside of it called the gallbladder. Those are the two big organs in your right upper quadrant. And then if you go down to the lower quadrants, mainly what you're going to see is intestines, uh, small, large intestine. You have a right lower quadrant, and then you have a left lower quadrant. Okay, so why are these important? Why do we care? Why, why do we need to know left, right, upper, lower? It's all one big abdominal pelvic cavity, right? Yes, it is. But this can really, really help you in uh, diagnosing <laughs> yourself or diagnosing others and really um, seeking medical attention, medical aid uh, faster than somebody who is not aware of their own anatomy. For example, if you have right lower quadrant pain and you have some possible fever, sweating going on and some vomiting, there's only so many things that it can be. Nine out of 10 times, if you have right lower quadrant pain sensitive to touch, and you have those other symptoms, some of you already know what I'm talking about, that's appendicitis. And yes, one out of 10 times it can be something else, but for the most part, there's something wrong with your appendix. And if that bursts, we can be in really, really big trouble in regards to bacteria being in places where it's not supposed to be. Versus if we have right upper quadrant pain where that liver gallbladder area is, that can be indicative of hepatitis. That can be indicative of gallstones. Or something like that. Uh, left lower quadrant pain could be some type of diverticulitis, diverticulosis. 
left upper quadrant pain can be a stomach ulcer. It can be a, a pancreatic issue. So by knowing the anatomy, you can know possibly what's going on without having to get a $5,000 CAT scan MRI. Now, a lot of times you, we do need to verify these things. Sometimes you do need that. But if somebody comes into your clinic or your hospital or your emergency room and says, hey, I have right, it hurts right here, right lower quadrant, and I vomited four times today, you know pretty quickly that you need to get a CAT scan of that area to confirm that this is appendicitis. Uh, they're, they're not having a heart attack. They're not, um, it's more than likely not cancer. Um, they're not having an autoimmune condition. It, it, this is appendicitis. And we, we, now that we narrowed it down to pro probably this is the only thing, we can zoom in, help the patient faster, get them treated faster, so we don't have any serious complications. So this is important. We, we do need to understand where the anatomy is. With that said, let's move on to the abdominal regions and talk about these. So what I would like to do is start in the middle, middle section and just kind of work our way around. The middle section is pretty easy because most of us have heard of this term before, the umbilical region. And the umbilical region is referring to the belly button. So the very middle, middle portion of your belly is where we should have a belly button. And that's where the umbilical cord attaches to mom during pregnancy. Gives us all mom's nutrients and oxygen and helps us get rid of the bad stuff too. So the umbilical region right in the middle. If you go laterally out to the sides of the umbilical region, what you'll see is the lumbar regions. You have the left and right lumbar regions. Now, typically speaking, lumbar is really going to refer to the low back area, but it does wrap around into this oblique area in regards to the cavity. So you are going to have part of your intestines in this area, the right and left lumbar regions. Let's move superior. Let's, so let's cover those top three. Uh, directly superior to the umbilical region, we have something called the epigastric region. Epi means upon or on top of. And gastric is going to refer, if I have a gastric bypass or a gastric ulcer, that's referring to your stomach. So this area is kind of on top of that stomach organ, and that's where we get the name from, epigastric. Going laterally to the epigastric, you get the right and left hypochondriac regions. Now, I'm sure some of y'all have heard this term before. I'm a hypochondriac. Um, my wife will confirm for you. Hi, uh, what a hypochondriac is, is somebody who thinks there's more wrong with them than actually well, what is wrong with them, right? If somebody starts sneezing and they sneeze on you, I'm going to start freaking out thinking I, I, I have the flu too, if, if that's what, what it is. Or um, I, I pull a hamstring muscle and I think I tore the whole thing and I need surgery. I, I overreact to certain injuries, certain illnesses, right? And that's what a hypochondriac is, but in its same spelling, same pronunciation, going to be a little different here. Um, what the word chondro means, or chondri in anatomy, is cartilage. And hypo means below, or less than or underneath. So, for example, if I have hypotension, that means I have low blood pressure. If I have hypoglycemia, I have low glucose, low sugar. So what this is actually saying is hypo is below, chondro is cartilage. And if you notice right here with these check marks, you have these bones. These bones are called ribs. But what actually is attaching the ribs to your breastbone, which is right here in red, your sternum, this area in green is not bone tissue, believe it or not. It's cartilage. And we'll learn about the different types of cartilage later, but this area, this block or this region is right underneath all of that rib cartilage. So that's where they got the name from. All that means is under the rib cartilage, excuse me, under the cartilage of the rib. So hypochondriac, under cartilage region. Kind of cool. Now that you know that little fun fact, cool party fact. Last but not least, let's look at the bottom three, the inferior three of the regions. You have the hypo gastric region and we just you know what that means already right gastric means stomach hypo means below or less than or decreased so this is just the area way below our stomach 
this is where you're going to see the bladder and the uterus and kind of the lower distal portions of the, the colon, the rectum area. And then to the left and right of that laterally is the iliac regions, right and left iliac. And if you see this bone right here, this bone is uh, also known as your love handle bone. If you feel the, the bone that kind of sticks out on the sides of your pelvic region, that's called the ilium bone. So ilium or iliac bone is where they get that name from. And that's, once again, that's where that appendicitis is going to be. It's going to be kind of right between this umbilical region and your right iliac region, kind of right in this spot, that green dot. So make sure you study these and make sure you can apply directional terminology to them. For example, if I say the left iliac region is inferior to the what region? So here, left iliac region is inferior to what? On a test, you would have to tell me it is the left lumbar region. So let's apply some of these body cavities and regions and put it to the test. So same thing as before, pause the video. I would encourage you to do so and then hit play when you are ready to go over the answers. So number one, in which body cavity would the removal of the uterus occur in? So here we're just talking about cavities. We're not talking about the tic-tac-toe board or the crosshairs or anything like that. This is a very broad, generic question it's asking you for the cavity and therefore the uterus as, as females as you know it's kind of inferior uh, near the bladder region below your belly button so this would be in that abdominal pelvic cavity region so I'll, I'll just put pelvic because that's more of a specific answer um, but the best answer it, it would be the abdominal pelvic area just don't say cranial or thoracic or something like that now remember, anything that's not central nervous system related, anything that's not your brain or your spinal cord is also part of the ventral cavity. So if we're being very, very broad and very nonspecific, we could also just say anterior or ventral cavity. That would also be absolutely 100% correct. But for practice purposes, let's be specific as we can so we make sure we know what we know. Number two, in which body cavity would an epidural be given for pain during childbirth? So an epidural is just inferior to where the spinal cord kind of ends, um, and what its purpose is to pretty much numb everything so the mom doesn't experience as much pain uh, with the childbirth process. So this is going to be delivered in that dorsal cavity, that central nervous system area. And if we're going to be even more specific, we should say the spinal cavity. Right where that spinal cord region actually is. So dorsal cavity, spinal cavity. I'll put SP for spinal. Number three, in which body cavity would a stomach ulcer operation occur? So once again, we're still talking about cavities here. So your stomach is in your abdomen. So the best answer would be your abdominal cavity or your abdominal pelvic cavity. And once again, you can also say ventral because it's not central nervous system. Number four, in which body cavity is the heart located in? A lot of different answers here. We can go very broad and say the ventral cavity. We can be a little bit more specific and we can say thoracic cavity. Let's be a little bit more specific. What's that middle portion of the thoracic cavity called? It's called the mediastinum. Very good. And then let's be even more specific. Let's actually, what is the actual cavity of the heart called itself? Not nothing else. And what that's called is the pericardial cavity. So I'll just abbreviate that PC. But if, if you're looking for the spelling, just refer back to your previous slides. So all of those are technically correct. But as you go more to the right, thoracic, mediastinum, pericardial, you're, you're just getting more and more specific. Number five, which abdominal pelvic region? So now we're talking about the tic-tac-toe boards here, okay, or, or the quadrants, but in this case, it, it's going to be the tic-tac-toe board because we're asking you about the umbilical region. 
So which abdominal pelvic region is located superior to the umbilical region? So everybody touch your belly button and then go superior and you'll be in that kind of square of the tic-tac-toe board and your answer should be the epigastric region. So the part right above the belly button, referring to on top of that stomach area. And then number six, a patient lying on their belly would be in a what position? This is kind of referring back to the beginning part of the chapter, directional terminology. Uh, we had prone and supine were our answer choices. Somebody lying on their belly getting a massage would be in the prone position. If you're lying on your back looking up at the ceiling, that would be the supine position. So check, you can check our answers as we're going through these uh, ventral pelvic. Everything lines up so far. Very good, very good. Um, on number five, it kind of gives us two options. It's kind of like a multiple choice, I, I guess. Uh, your options are epigastric or right iliac. Um, right iliac is definitely incorrect, right? So we arrived at epigastric. Awesome. And then our two choices between number six was prone and supine, and we arrived at prone. Awesome. All right, our final section for chapter one is in regards to homeostasis. So let's dive into what homeostasis actually is. As you can see on your PowerPoint slide in your notes, it says homeostasis is a relative constancy of the internal environment of the body. Okay, kind of a detailed definition there. Um, another way you can spin that is balance. Another way you can spin that is equilibrium. Another way you can say that is your body doing what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it or what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it. So it's your body making sure that everything is intact, everything is good, everything is constant. Um, kind of like a thermostat if you think about it that way where your thermostat let's say it's summertime and you want your room temperature to be at 70 degrees during the summer well what happens is it's not 70 degrees out during the summertime or at least in certain parts of the world it gets really really hot so the house starts getting warm but what happens is as it's as soon as it hits above 70 71 72 degrees that thermostat kicks in and says, hey, it's getting too warm. Let's turn on some cold air. It blows the cold air in the house and it brings it back to that set point. That's what homeostasis kind of is. It's bringing your body back to this constant or this set desirable range of points. So we're going to talk about many, many, many different examples. But pretty much every single process in the body consists of three parts going on and I know in your notes says four but I, I, I want to show you these first three and then talk about the fourth one so we'll kind of draw a line right here everything that happens in your body one two three is gonna happen in those that order and we're going to hit this hard now. We're going to talk about this again big time in the nervous system and the heart chapter, respiratory, all the time. So very, very important slide here. Number one, regardless of what we're doing, whether you are walking out in the park, whether you are listening to this video, whether a bright light shines in your eye, whether your liver is breaking down glycogen, whether your pancreas is releasing insulin, whether you're exercising, whatever you're doing, something has to happen for the body to make a change. So what we call this is a stimulus. Anything that happens in the body or even outside the body, such as something crawling on your skin, is a stimulus. Me talking, sound waves hitting your ear is a stimulus. Bright light outside, stimulus. You're getting too warm or too cold, that's a stimulus. Anything happening, your belly's grumbling because you're hungry, that's a stimulus. So any type of change. Now what we have is we have these little sensors or these little receptors all throughout our body that detect these stimuli 
or plural stimuluses, right? Stimu stimulus is stimuli is many stimulus. And what we do is we take that information from those receptors and we send it to our control center. And 99% of the time, our control center is going to be our brain, right? Our brain is what tells, we, we talked about the different organ systems, what's telling your body to digest, what's telling your bones to heal, what's telling your bones to make new blood cells, for the most part, is your central nervous system, your brain, and your brain stem. So we get, some, we get a receptor, we get a stimulus, a sensation, something's crawling on us, or we're hungry, and it sends a message to your brain. And then your brain figures out what to do with that information. Your brain kind of calculates what's going on. And then once your brain calculates what's going on, we do something about it. We have an effect. And we carry out the action to maintain balance. So once again, hundreds of different examples. I'll, I'll just spit some top of my head. Um, you're hungry. Your belly's grumbling. So you get messages to your brain saying, I'm hungry and your body probably tells you to eat right your, your frontal lobe or your your conscious mind says I'm kind of hungry maybe I should eat some food if you're talking a lot like me my throat's getting a little dry right now the stimulus is a dry throat tells my brain that I'm dry, that it's dry my mouth starts to dry up a little bit not a lot of saliva going on the effect is well you're probably kind of thirsty so the effect the the symptom of a dry throat can be fixed with some water I shine a bright light in your eye. That's the stimulus. Your brain says, oh man, that bright light could damage your eye. We need to protect ourselves. So what's your effect? What do you do if I shine a bright light in your eye? You look away or you close your eyes or you squint or you put your hand up, right? If you have high blood pressure, your body gets that s signal and we have different hormones and different mechanisms to lower the blood pressure. Now, when your homeostasis or when this system gets out of whack long term, that's where we get the disease processes. That's where we get the labels. So if I have chronic hypertension, which means I have high blood pressure and my body can't correct it on its own, yeah, that's where you might want to go see a health professional and get some medication or start exercise and changing your diet, meditation, that kind of stuff. But for the most part, every single thing in our body right now, we're having stimuli all over and inside our body and our brain is keeping everything working properly. So what we call this one, two, three step right here, this is called a feedback loop or a feedback mechanism. And as you can see, changes to the system are recognized and they affect future activity of the effector system. So your body can sometimes get used to a stimulus, right? If, uh, for example, I put a watch on or a necklace on in the morning, the stimulus is that watch is touching my skin. It's kind of weird, kind of irritating. I don't really like it. Your brain says, "Okay, that's kind of weird. So let's uh, let's you know let's scratch our skin a little bit, or let's move the watch to a more comfortable position." And then, as you can see with the feedback, changes to the system are recognized, and therefore we don't eventually we don't really worry about that. We kind of get used to it. Um, and another example is exercise, right? Exercising for the first time. Uh, I, I took a long time away from the gym and from running. I went and ran two miles the other day and I was extremely sore. Oh my goodness, I was so sore, so uncomfortably sore. Um, and then guess what? I took a few days off. I took about a week off actually. And then I ran the same two miles. Not only did I do it faster, but I'm not really even sore the next day. How cool is that? Your body eventually gets used to it and the effector system, it, it's, it wasn't as big of a shock to me. So. Let's go into a little bit more detail and talk about the two different types of feedback mechanisms and what's controlling these set points on the next slide. So the two types of feedback mechanisms or feedback loops as they're called are negative and positive. Now, these are not good and bad, um, both are good. It's just that negative has to deal with shutting down a stimulus or opposing a stimulus. So something happens in the body and we want to oppose that or fix it. So for example, 
let's put a big H in the middle of the slide right here. This is for homeostasis or our normal. If my blood pressure gets too high, that's a problem, right? That can lead to disease later in life. So what I want to do is I want to oppose that. Something in my body has to bring it back down to homeostasis or to normal. Same thing. You can flip it either way. If my blood pressure is too low, that's really bad too. That means my body may not be getting enough oxygen and nutrients. I'm probably going to be passing out a lot if I'm not getting enough oxygen to my brain. So I need to fix that real quick. So something in my body needs to bring it back up to normal or homeostasis. And you can see with that drawing that I just did with those arrows going up and down, we kind of created this little loop mechanism. So when something's too high, our body fixes it by lowering it. When something's too low, our body fixes it by raising it. And how we're accomplishing this is we're, whatever's causing it to go high, we're shutting that down. We're saying, okay, no more high blood pressure, we gotta lower the blood pressure. So we're opposing it. And that's where we get the name negative. We're just having a negative response or a, an opposite effect of what's actually causing the, ori the original problem. And you can see all the cool, neat examples here. I'll have some pictures on the next few slides, but we can talk about this with blood sugar, with blood glucose. If your glucose is too high, that's bad. <laughs> that's really bad. Um, there's a reason why diabetics have to watch their diets, right? If, if you've ever seen a diabetic eat, eat too much sugar and they didn't take the proper amount of insulin, that can be really, really bad. Same thing though, if your blood sugar gets too low, we need to figure out a way to raise it internally. Uh, body temperature, we'll talk about that as well. Body temperature, if you're too hot, you need to cool down so you don't have a heat stroke and die. If you're too cold, you need to find a way to warm your body up so you don't die of hypothermia and your organs shut down. So the control center figures that out and you all already know how the control center affects it or responds, right? So if I'm really, really hot, what does my brain cause my body to do so I don't overheat and get a heat stroke? It tells you to start sweating. Exactly. And sweating basically is taking water from your body and pouring it on your skin. It's a similar effect to taking a water bottle and just pouring water all over your skin. By cooling off the skin, effectively, hopefully, you're going to be cooling off the body. That's, what, that's why we sweat. Let's flip it. If you're really, really cold, your brain senses that's a problem, so it does something to help fix that. What does your brain do when you're really cold? It causes your body to shiver all over your body, right? And that shivering causes the muscles to move. And when you move muscles, you warm up, you generate heat, right? Go to the gym and start on a treadmill or an elliptical or just start doing some jumping jacks or push-ups. After five minutes, you may start sweating because your muscles are moving. Heat is a natural byproduct of that. So. Once again, big picture, there's a stimulus, the brain is the control center, figures out what's going on, and we respond to that, we fix it. And hopefully we're fixing it to where it's in that homeostatic range, that normal range. Really good picture here, just an illustration showing you what's going on, what we just discussed. So the stimulus talks to the receptor, that's kind of number one. And then we go to the control center, the control center is made aware of that stimulus, figures out what to do, and then it does something about it. Number three, it affects it. So as we just talked about, body temperature exceeds 37 degrees Celsius, which that's a 98.6 Fahrenheit ballpark, give or take a degree. So your body temperature is above 98.6, that's bad long term. So we alert the brain. The brain has a temperature center and something called the hypothalamus that makes sure that we don't overheat or get too cold. And then that hypothalamus is going to tell your body to start sweating. So we cool our body off. So sensor stimulus or sensor receptor, control center, and then the effect of what we do to change it. And once again, you can do this with anything, blood sugar, blood pressure, blood volume, uh, temperature, anything. Another good example here with blood sugar. What we have is 
a something that causes your blood glucose to change. Let's start here. It's kind of a loop, right? Remember, so it is a circle. But let's say these two are number one. So something is causing your glucose levels to change. You just ate a jelly donut um, at 7 a.m. So for eight, nine hours you've been sleeping and your body's been monitoring your sugar and maintaining your sugar levels and then you just put 40 grams of sugar in it in five minutes. So we have receptors in our pancreas organ that helps us regulate that sugar. We tell the brain, hey, well in this case it's the brain of the pancreas actually. Uh, sometimes we don't always have to use the brain brain even though the brain is involved with sugar regulation. Um, sometimes the pancreas can do its own thing. Um, another example is like with a reflex. When a doctor t hits your knee to test your reflexes, that actually doesn't really involve your brain. That's more of just a spinal cord um, response. So it's not always brain involved, but for the most part, the brain is in control of these things. Uh, so what's going to happen is once our sugar goes through the roof due to that jelly donut, your blood sugar needs to come down. So the pancreas is going to release a hormone called insulin. And the effect of insulin, so that would be number three, insulin tells all the cells in the body to, hey, take this extra blood sugar in the blood and use it for energy. So we have these little channels inside or on the outside of the cells that actually suck in the sugar and then we can use that sugar for energy and that's why carbs are so good for you. That's why eating a jelly donut isn't the worst thing in the world. We just, talking about homeostasis, talking about balance, we just don't want to do too much of that, right? You don't want to eat a jelly donut every day for a year, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? So big picture, you can see we have our receptor sensor uh, responding to a stimulus. We have our control center. Our control center does something about it. And hopefully what that's doing is it's monitoring our glucose change. So with the help of insulin, bringing all the glucose into the cells, our glucose levels are no longer high. They're back down to normal. So that you eat the jelly donut and you don't have a diabetic crisis. So that was negative feedback. Negative feedback is by far the more common of the two. Positive feedback is a little different. So negative is focusing on balance, right? Something gets too high, we need to bring it back down. Something gets too low, we need to bring it back up. Positive, there's not kind of, a, there's not really too much of a balance concern. Whatever's causing something to go up, we're going to make it go more up, if that makes sense. So we're going to have a stimulus, and we're going to make the stimulus even more severe. So just hang with me. It's kind of the opposite of negative feedback. So negative, we were focused on balance and homeostasis. Positive, no way. We're going the opposite direction. Something's happening and we're going to make it more severe, more drastic, more dramatic. So we're intensifying things. Now, as I mentioned, negative feedbacks are way more common than positives. Uh, your body's constantly working through negative feedbacks. But there are a few rare positive feedback loops that I do need you to know. And we're going to talk about a um, couple of these this semester. A lot of them will be next semester with Anatomy and Physiology 2. Uh, but the two big ones I want you to know now are childbirth and blood clotting. And let, let's do breastfeeding as well, nursing as well. The immune response will have a whole section on that with, with antibodies and all sorts of things. But childbirth and breastfeeding after the child's born and then blood clotting are the three big, big examples. We'll also introduce others with the digestive system and the reproductive system next semester. So let's talk about childbirth and see how this is a positive feedback reaction. And if any of you in this class is a mother, uh, you'll be able to help me out and confirm this, what I'm talking about. So, as you can see, really, really good picture here, good illustration uh, to, to kind of just give you an idea. Um, and this, this is the female's legs. You can see the spine is right here. So then the back would be continuing up here. The mom's head would be up here. So we're looking at the mom's belly region and the uterus is where the baby is at. So we're looking at a natural birth here and the baby's about to come out. That baby's pretty big. <laughs> so 
During the birthing process, once the water breaks, a whole chain of reactions, big domino effect starts playing, and what happens is the first contraction occurs. And the first contraction, you can talk to a mom, on a pain scale of 0 to 10, is probably not a 10 yet, right? It's not that big of a deal. It's maybe a little shock, but, you know, it's it's it hurts, but it's not... It doesn't feel like you're dying, that first contraction. And it doesn't last that long. It, it kind of comes, and then it's gone, and then you're good. And then you have to wait several minutes until the next one. But what a contraction does is this. A contraction, where, when this whole uterus thing that's protecting the baby, when the uterus contracts, it's pushing the baby down towards what we call the cervix and the vaginal canal so the baby can actually be pushed out. Now, as we push that baby out, we have receptors in this area. I'll highlight it in, uh, in gold. We have receptors, stretch receptors in that area, so when they are stretched, they send a message to our control center. And I mentioned most of the times our control center is going to be our brain, our head. And our brain says, oh man, we're getting stretched, so we need to get that baby out. So what we're going to do is we're going to release a hormone called oxytocin. Some of you may have heard of that hormone. I'm highlighting it right here in green. Oxytocin. And oxytocin is a really cool hormone. It's called the, the cuddle drug. Um, it, it's kind of uh, how uh, males and females are, are attracted to each other, uh, right? Like when, when you're fresh in a relationship, all you want to do is be with that other person. Uh, the more... Um, togetherness you have with that person, the more oxytocin you're really, it's just a really feel good hormone. It's a happy drug. And what oxytocin does to the female uterus is it causes it to contract. So then we start this whole process again. We have a second contraction and that pain scale from zero to 10 kind of goes up, right ladies? As the contraction goes up, it causes more stretching. So the brain's made aware of that. The brain releases more oxytocin. Well, what does oxytocin do? It causes another contraction. This time stronger. So therefore, there's more stretching. And therefore, we send more oxytocin, which is going to make the contraction stronger. And more and more and more, and you're, you're get, kind of getting the point here. So we go from a very light contraction with a lot of space in between to where these contractions feel like you're about to die and they're every few <laughs> few minutes, few seconds, right? It just gets more and more and more and more severe. There's no balance here. There's no, oh, this is too high, let's calm it down a little bit. It's gonna get worse and worse and worse until that baby comes out. That's a positive feedback reaction. Another example with, it, with what we can talk about is, is breastfeeding. Uh, breastfeeding, kind of the same thing. Um, milk doesn't usually come out. It's not ejected until there's a stimulus. So there has to be a baby suckling in order for the brain to say, oh, okay, it's feeding time. Let's release the milk. Um, or sometimes if, it's very, if the body's really, really sensitive, it can just be a cry. Right? And you've seen moms that they can lactate randomly um, due to a baby's cry. It doesn't even have to be their own kid. It just means their hormones are really, really um, at high levels is all. Uh, the other example that you need to know is blood clotting. And it's the same principle here. If, if I am bleeding, there is no balance, right? We need to make sure we only have so much blood in our body. We only have about four to six liters of blood. So even if I'm dripping just drops of blood at a time, I will eventually run out of blood, even if it's just like a little scrape on my finger. I will run out of blood eventually if I don't clot it. So there's no balance when it comes to clotting. What's going to happen, I'll clear out some of this, all of this. When I am bleeding, my body is going to send what we call platelets. Platelets are kind of the um, blood, they're not blood cells, they're blood properties, blood fragments that help us clot our blood. So as I'm bleeding, let's say we send 10 platelets to the injury site. And that didn't do anything. That didn't touch anything. I'm still bleeding. 
So the brain says, oh no, uh, we're still bleeding, so let's send 100 platelets. Okay, well you slowed down the bleeding, but I'm still bleeding. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to send more. We're going to keep sending them and going and going higher and higher and higher and higher until we stop the bleeding because we don't want to die. So there's no balance here. There's no too high, too low. We're going to send as many of these things as we can and more and more until the job is done. That's a positive feedback loop. All right, y'all, so that is the end of your first chapter. Uh, make sure you're looking over all these big concepts. Make sure you know the directional terms. Make sure you know the properties of life. Make sure you know the difference between positive and negative feedback and, and be able to identify examples. And let's move on to chapter two.